Uh, I'm Steve Anderson, and I'm the director of the Cell Technology Shared Resource, which is one of the two oldest uh, shared resources in uh, the Cancer Center. Uh, it's not clear whether uh, we were established in 1986 or 1987 at the same time that the Flow Core was established. Uh, and on this uh, opening slide, I'm showing an image of a spheroid that we uh, captured with the Incusite Organoid um, Imaging Module, which I'll talk about later in the talk. Our shared resource has uh, three specific uh, goals. Uh, one is to provide state-of-the-art cell-based technology instrumentation uh, imaging uh, to investigators. Um, so we support all aspects of cell-based uh, technologies, including production of, reprodu of recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, organate culture, and live cell imaging to support basic and preclinical research. We provide educational seminars. We support the rigor and research course with lectures, didactic exercises. And we also provide outside technical consultation, particularly with regard to the use of the incusite. And we support shared uh, activities and other shared resources that require recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, or authenticated cell lines. I'm the director of the shared resource and I have been for about 15 years. Uh, Lori Sherman was the manager of the shared resource. Unfortunately, she departed the end of February and we're currently searching for a new manager. And Max Drummond is the PRA. Um, he's uh, learning uh, general cell culture, protein expression, manages the incusite as well as our mycoplasma and SDR profiling uh, programs at this point. So I wanna talk about the services that we provide and, and the equipment. Um, we have uh, all sorts of incubators at a variety of temperatures that can accommodate both the growth of mammalian cells and insect cells uh, from small volume up to <clears throat> five liter capacity, allowing us to do projects that span from five mils to five liters. Uh, we have all the necessary equipment for that. We have been very active in, in live cell imaging using the Incusite platform, which I'll talk about later, but that allows you to look at cell migration, cell invasion, formation of organoids, spheroids, uh, angiogenesis, neurogenesis, look at cell proliferation, as well as do real-time detection of uh, both living and apoptotic cells. Uh, we are heavily involved in the production of purification of proteins. Uh, we use the GE uh, wave system, which has uh, Teflon bags that have a capacity of five liters in addition to traditional shaker flasks. And we use the ATCA uh, purification system. With regard to the provision of uh, cells, we have a, a bank of over 500 authenticated human cancer cell lines. Uh, we also have mouse cell lines in our collection, canine cell lines. We can do same day mycoplasma testing as well as cell line authentication by SDR analysis in collaboration with the Molecular Biology Corps and the Barbara Davis Center. We have an extensive backup capacity of in excess of 10,000 vials, and we offer uh, <coughs> rental of our uh, liquid nitrogen space to investigators. <clears throat> Since the beginning of the core, we've been heavily involved in hybridoma production, produced over 1,500 hybridomas. Starting in 1990, we started using baculovirus as an expression system, uh, expressing uh, proteins in, in insect cells. And for about the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we've also done large scale production of proteins in 293 cells. We can purify these and we consult on all our protein expression and purification projects uh, throughout the university. With regard to general cell culture <laughs> services, we grow cells from people that don't have uh, either the facility or the experience in doing cell lines for in vivo studies. <clears throat> we also do very large uh, preps of people uh, or people ranging from five to as much as 50 liters of cells when they're needed for uh, either purification studies. Uh, we generate nuclear RFP or GFP tag cells for use in uh, the incusite and we have an existing library of about 30 different cancer cell lines that can be used. We do large scale uh, 
production purification of monoclonal antibodies, either using hybridomas or transfected cells. Uh, and again, do the same uh, in 293 cells. Uh, with regard to cell lines and cell line authentication, uh, I think that uh, there's still, a, it surprises me, there are still people that don't understand the importance of this. And I have borrowed this slide from a presentation done by Christopher Korsch, who used to be with the university, but has since retired. And I wanted to remind people that in a 16 year period, uh, Christopher had profiled over 1600 samples from the university. And he found many, many examples of misidentified or contaminating cell lines. And this included more than 80 imposter cell lines. I'm showing you this figure because uh, as you can see, the extent of uh, not authenticated cells varies tremendously. Uh, in 117 uh, breast cancer sensor cell lines, he found that over 15% were non-authentic. Perhaps uh, most striking was uh, his studies of thyroid cancer cell lines of 44, half of them were not authentic and none of the human cell lines were in fact authentic. Many were not human and many were not thyroid. <clears throat> Overall, we have the general impression that uh, depending on the lab, anywhere from 15% uh, to as much as 60% of the cell lines that we test are not authentic. Uh, therefore, uh, we believe that it's really important that we attack this problem. The International Cell Line Authentication Committee has identified over 450 cell lines that are misidentified, and 140 of these are actually uh, HeLa cells. And this also represents the problem with use of authentic cell lines. As part of our effort, we do two things. Uh, first of all, we provide an authentication service in which uh, PIs provide us with uh, cells. We extract the DNA in conjunction with the molecular biology core. We do multiplex PCR to look at 50 different alleles. The alleles are analyzed. We analyze the data, compare it to different data sets, and we can provide you with a certificate of authenticity with regard to the identity of your cell line. All the cells that we provide, we know are authentic and are clean. So uh, the question is, when should you be authenticating your cell lines? Clearly, when you receive the cell line from another investigator, even if that person is in the same lab, we suggest that you do it at the beginning and the end of a project. Some journals are suggesting <clears throat> that you authenticate cells prior to the submission of a manuscript. And we uh, certainly teach in the rigor and research course that one should authenticate the cells after each modification of a cell line. For example, after using lentivirus to knock down cell lines. Also, if you observe changes in the appearance of growth properties of cell lines, that's uh, telling you that you need to see that you're still working with the cell lines that you believe. And clearly, if you're establishing a, a seed stock uh, that you're gonna freeze down to support your lab for the next you know, 10 years or more, uh, you should be authenticating that before you uh, freeze down the cells. We, as I said, have a library of over 500 authenticated human cancer cell lines. We only distribute authenticated cell lines. We also have a large bank of uh, mouse cell lines, although they're currently not authenticated by STR analysis because we don't have that capability on the campus yet. We have a panel of authenticated K-line tumor cell lines that were generated at CSU. We currently are serving as a repository for both uh, human thyroid uh, cancer cell lines established by Rebecca Schweppe, as well as some lung cancer cell lines that were established by Robert Doble. Um, for investigators who are interested in getting new cell lines uh, from commercial or repositories, we will facilitate the acquisition. We purchase the cell lines, we create stocks, and in the process, we handle all the MTA issues such that uh, we have clear province of the cells. As I indicated before, we provide long-term storage of cells for uh, all of our collection, but also PIs can rent boxes in our storage system. Our goal is to provide cell lines at a cost that is equal to STR profiling and mycoplasma testing. And we want to answer all your needs for established cell lines. But I do wanna point out that we do not handle primary cell lines just because the issues involved in their use uh, really preclude our involvement in that. So I mentioned mycoplasma and uh, why should we care about that? The reality is that almost every aspect of a cell uh, biology 
is affected by uh, infection with mycoplasma. Uh, it changes the growth properties, their metabolism, chromosomal aberrations, DNA fragmentation, transfection efficiency is altered, sensitivity and inducers of apoptosis. All of these things are affected by mycoplasma contamination. Um, studies around the world have indicated that anywhere from 15 to 35 percent of established cell lines are mycoplasma contaminated. And some 10 to 20 percent of sequence and published RNA seq studies are actually mycoplasma and not from the cell that you're studying. So, this gives you an idea of the complexity of the problem. I would say over the last 15 years, my own experience is that uh, anywhere from uh, perhaps 10% to as much as 65% of cells from a single lab uh, here on our campus are mycoplasma contaminated, indicating that not everyone is paying attention to this issue. Uh, we provide same-day mycoplasma testing using a, a Lanza test kit, and because we're not in your lab, we can provide you independent verification that the cells you're working with are both authentic as well as not contaminated with mycoplasma. Perhaps the biggest uh, thing that we've offered over the last uh, five or six years is the use of the Incusite uh, cell, live cell imaging platform. Uh, this is a platform that sits within the incubator itself. It has six different positions in which you can place different tissue culture vessels. Uh, most frequently used are 96 well plates as indicated. Uh, there's a microscope objective that travels underneath the vessel and takes images at predefined times. This can be once a day, it can be once every 20 minutes. It depends on the design of the experiment. It can quantitate cells uh, using phase optics, or you can use both uh, GFP or RFP labeled cells. Uh, we prefer the nuclear label because the nucleus doesn't change as much as the cytoplasmic labels do. Using this instrument, you can quantitate cell proliferation and apoptosis without sample destruction. You can quantitate cell cycle progression using either cell changes in cell shape or reporters. You can study cell migration or chemotaxis, colony growth or organoid growth, angiogenesis or neurogenesis, netosis and ephrocytosis. Uh, and I want to point out, as I mentioned earlier, we have a collection of authenticated nuclear GFP or RFP cell lines, as well as can generate new ones for investigators. Uh, in the top right panel, uh, you see imaging of cells. Uh, actually, there's two different cells, one labeled RFP and another labeled GFP. And uh, by quantitating the number of red or green cells over time, here imaged every four hours, you can look at the proliferation of these cells over uh, hours to days. And in this case, the cells are in the same culture. Uh, it's, it's a clever use of the system itself. Um, I'm gonna show three examples of studies that have been done by investigators on our campus. Uh, the first one looks at uh, tumor cell migration. This was done by Jessica Christensen and Jennifer Reichert's lab, looking at the response of invasion uh, in cells uh, following treatment with androgen receptor inhibitors. Uh, the Incusite uh, has a, a wound tool that allows you to create a very reproducible scratch across each of the 96 wells. The plate is then washed and put into the Incusite and you can image that scratch uh, very, very precisely at regular intervals, say two hours, four hours, whatever the defined uh, time you're interested in. And the Incusite software will actually quantitate closure of the scratch as shown in the figure here. So this is a very, very nice way for you to get very quantitative, highly reproducible uh, migration assays. It's, it's, it's a world better than scratching it with a micro pet tip the way many of us have done in the past. The second use that I wanna uh, share was actually um, done in Carol Satoris' lab by a former graduate student. And uh, it was one of the first studies done in the United States to look using uh, gene uh, promoter reporter vectors, in this case, Carol's lab had made a CK5 promoter linked to GFP. 
they knew that uh, the effect of uh, progesterone on cells was to increase the number of cancer stem cells that expressed cytokeratin-5. Thus, uh, we could look at changes in the number of cancer stem cells in T47D cells following treatment with either progesterone, estrogen, or vehicle. So in the graph, uh, I mean, the two figures on the left in the center, you see uh, two different time points. The green cells are expressing um, the GFP reporter, whereas the red cells are not. In the graph in panel C, you see the increase in the number of GFP uh, positive cells over time uh, imaged every four hours. So again, this is a very quantitative, uh, reproducible, um, non-destructive method in which to look at this. And you don't have to come into the lab every four hours to get this kind of data because the machine just does it all the time. The last example that I want to give is a very new one that has been published done by Michelle Williams and Jennifer Reichert's lab in which we were able to quantitate ephrocytosis. So this is uh, when activated um, macrophage are able to engulf uh, tumor cells. And it's very clever because one labels your target cells, the tumor cells, with this pH roto uh, dye, which um, turns red when it's engulfed into macrophage because the lysosome changes the pH and the cells turn red. And so you're, here you're able to quantitate the number of red appearing cells, that is, in tumor cells engulfed by macrophage. And she's used three different sources of uh, engulfing cells, raw uh, 264.7 cells, THB1 cells, or bone marrow-derived macrophage. And so this is, I think, really, really promising to look at aspects of the immune response in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, next, uh, we've been involved uh, in the production of hybridomas since the opening of the core. That was Dean Edwards' specialty. Over that time, uh, we've generated over 1,500 hybridomas. In the current year, uh, we probably have a half dozen projects we'll be doing. We handle all steps of the process. We hold an IF Cook protocol, which investigators modify for their specific antigens. Uh, and once the hybridoma is generated, we hold uh, part of the cells for investigators, and we're equipped to do large-scale production of monoclonal antibodies anywhere from five to 50 milligrams, for example, to support preclinical studies in mice. Uh, so we try to make this effortlessly for anyone who's interested in generating uh, design hybridoma cell lines. We also have existing hybridomas um, to various epitope tags, which we're happy to provide you with either supernatant fluids or purified uh, IgG. We have to NIC, FLAG, HA, GST, we have monoclonal bodies to phosphotyrosine, various protein kinases like SARC, DEAN generated many dysteric uh, receptors, transcription factors, cofactors. Uh, we have a uh, number to organelle specific proteins, and uh, <clears throat> we uh, frequently serve as uh, a repository for hybridomas that have been uh, generated by faculty members when they retire. In fact, we've been going through our collection to identify others of interest, either for licensing or to advertise to our research community. Finally, we're involved in large-scale production of proteins, either using baculovirus expression in insect cells or mammalian expression uh, vectors being uh, put in, transfected into 293 cells. Most of our expression work involves uh, epitope tag molecules, making the purification of them uh, rather easy. Uh, we are proposing to expand in broader uh, purification techniques. And just for the record, we do not use uh, yeast or bacterial expressions in our core facility because we don't want to contaminate it. Although we can certainly assist with purification of proteins made in these expression platforms in your individual labs. We have a commitment to training and education We've, in the last five years, we've provided over 200 individual Incusite trainer sessions with our staff members. They're done in one-on-one -on -one in the core facility. Uh, people can download the Incusite software 
and uh, we also provide uh, some insight into data analysis. However, we have uh, also offered monthly office hours. Uh, it used to be a mon one Monday afternoon every month with one of the Satoria scientific experts, and they uh, really provide input on experimental design and data analysis. Presently, that is being done by um, uh, Zoom, although uh, we certainly hope that we'll have that back on site uh, in the coming months. We also uh, consult on generating new hybridomas and uh, problem solve with antigen choice and protocols. And we've had many seminars where we've invited speakers to talk about both uh, incocyte use and cell line authentication. We had uh, one in the fall by Sartorius, and actually this photo shows one that was just a few weeks before the uh, university closed down in 2020 for COVID. We have a commitment to rigor and research, obviously very committed to the use of authenticated cell lines and providing SDR analysis in conjunction with the molecular biology core facility. We have same day mycoplasma testing. We can provide secondary storage for critical samples. We have uh, authenticated monoclonal antibodies. All of our equipment are supported by service contracts and regular PM. As I indicated, we have uh, monthly office hours with Sartorius. We provide an on-site supply center for media products and for uh, fetal bovine serum that we have tested. We serve, currently are offering it at below market prices. And we serve as a focal point for rigor and research training uh, on the T32 grants. We have uh, an internal advisory committee that I'm listing here. Uh, Rebecca Shep, Swepi, Lynn Heasley, Raul Torres, and Dylan represents the Boulder and some of our out uh, offsite um, users. Uh, we meet annually. In the past, we've done annual surveys. Our committee reviews uh, the metrics, business plans, and all new uh, services. We have extensive support from the Cancer Center, both Haida Ford and Natalie Serkova, as well as uh, Michaela Montour, Jason. Jessica, Kelly, and Kim all provide support for our, our administration. Uh, we are located on the fifth floor of uh, RC1 South 5404B. Um, and I also indicate that uh, the Organoid Tissue Modeling Corps is next door in the Barbara Davis Center. Uh, our, our scheduling is uh, done through and requests are done through iLabs. And uh, you can contact either me or Max Drummond, uh, the PRA. As I mentioned, we also have lots of interactions with other shared resource. We provide pre reference lines to pathology. We store cells for functional genomics. We provide purified proteins uh, to structural biology. And we work closely with flow, uh, both in generation of GFP and RFP cell lines, screening of hybridoma lines for surface IG production, and we also occasionally provide control cells for their flow analysis. We have lots of interactions with the Flint Animal uh, Cancer Center at CSU. And we're providing their canine cell line section or uh, external investigators. And we also work with the Molecular Biology Core Facility at Barbara Davis. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, answer any questions. Um. Peter, I do have a couple of questions over the down. So you mentioned that you do not uh, provide services for the primary cell lines, which makes absolutely sense. But <clears throat> what do you think about the mycoplasma test? Uh, do you Have you ever seen that other APIs who have a primary uh, cell culture or especially PDX, right? I mean, how how fast can the mycoplasma uh, contamination happen? Is it necessary to do those tests for primary and PDX? So that's a very, very good question. And uh, I can provide you some answer. I think depending on where the primary cell lines come from, uh, mycoplasma can be uh, a major issue or a minor issue. Um, if they're from lung or airway, uh, it can be a, a huge issue at the very beginning. I'll just be honest. Um, with regard to how fast can cell lines become contaminated? Um, two answers. One is I 
from our own experience, we have provided labs with um, samples of cell lines and they've come back two weeks later saying that they're not growing right. And it's because we test them and they're mycoplasma contaminated. Now we have also tested the cells that we've given them. Uh, and so there's just some labs who's, I would say their tissue culture practice is not very rigorous and they can become rapidly contaminated. There are experimental studies that suggest if you put a source of mycoplasma in the back corner of the biohazard hood and just operate open, uh, you will detect, you can detect mycoplasma contamination within four days. So the expansion in a contaminated culture is very fast. So it's all dependent upon user practice in our mind. Thank you. Not to be preaching. <laughs> Eric. Yeah, uh, Steve, uh, thank you. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, in terms of hybridoma generation, um, you know, people make antibodies for monoclonals for various, you know, downstream applications. And so, you know, how, how do you navigate um, working with the investigator to to find the antibodies that fit their needs, you know, whether it's a flow cytometry or Western or right. IHC or. So, so that's a very good question. And I think what we usually talk about it upfront is, you know, if you want it for immunoblotting or immunoprecipitation, it's really easy. If you want it for IHC on paraffin embedded sections, it's usually a little bit more demanding and flow. You have to pay attention to structure and whether where what part of the protein it's expressed in. So what we usually talk about is where, you know, what is the structure of the protein. <clears throat> Sometimes we send them to talk to David Jones, for example, and look at a program to say what does the structure of it look like. Where is the sequence that you want to use, or to make predictions about uh, regions. And so we tend to go with more uh, avoid hydrophobic because often they're inside. Uh, we like ends sometimes if they have a nice structure, especially alpha helical. So by working with people, we can look at, uh, especially in structure, um, we can make some predictions. And there are some programs out there that, that are very good at making predictions. Bob Hodges used to be phenomenal at helping us, not only with prediction, but then synthesizing. And since his passing, we really haven't found someone to replace him uh, for his expertise. Uh, then the thing is after we get our initial clones, uh, we do a screening very quickly, and then they have to do screening with the detection system they want within the next two days. Uh, once you're at the point of screening clones, it's time it becomes really essential and they have to have their screening method well developed before we start the immunization process because you're right it's really critical especially for flow in my mind yep. great thank you appreciate it sure thyroid cancer was striking that the you know uh identification uh, it was just like wow it was like almost 50 percent right um right. Is there any reason why uh, you did not do colorectal like CRC? Because we have, to, right? I mean, I mean, especially when Gail was there, was a tons of the different CRC cell lines. Just, just out of curiosity. Uh, so I, these are just um, studies that Christopher did. You know, when people would give him cell lines, and, or he would go out and collect them from people, and um, so it's whatever came to his attention because he did SDR profiling and is still very actively involved in, on the committee work towards that. So I think he just took whatever people brought to him. Uh, I suspect he could give you information about colorectal cell lines. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, I also know that um, not listed there were bladder cancer cell lines and we have tested Many of those, uh, there, there's also a lot of problems with bladder cancer cell lines. You know, the, the, the famous two are EJ and T24 and uh, some places have them misidentified and some have things that are not either. And, and that's tragic since those are the cell lines that were used to identify RAS as the first human oncogene important in tumor genesis. I have a class, quick question for you too. Sure. Uh, you know, we do gene expression, RNA-seq, all kinds of sequencing. Right, so right. Sometimes we 
sequence a uh, human cell line experiment, but identify some mouse sequences in it. Did you yeah, see that yeah, kind of yeah. contamination? Well, um, one can test their cell lines for um, species of origin. And it's not uncommon that people have found mouse cell lines in human. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, oh, Peter's got it. I can recall that, um, you know, we had some monkey cell lines that were established uh, in the lab because we worked with S40 and they were all contaminated with HeLa. So cross-species contamination is real. Uh, it's a huge issue um, in the uh, PDX world, right? Because uh, once they go into mouse, it seems as though many of the, the cancer associated fibroblasts are often mouse and not human. So in, in the PDX models, it's, it's very real. And I think that if you take a human cell line and pass it through mouse, then come back, you have a real chance that you've got mouse cells in there. And, and we ourselves have done that at different times. So I think there's a lot of reasons why that could happen.